So today we're going to be covering the concepts of object-oriented programming, uh, which are the foundations of every well-built object-oriented application. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what they are and how they are used. We'll see some examples. Um, this is the core of every object-oriented design and every planning and every architecture of any object-oriented project that you'll be working on. You'll have to start building classes. So we've seen classes and we've digged a little bit into classes and instances and uh, statics and all that. Um, but today we're going to dive a little bit more into into additional concepts in the periphery of classes and we're going to see inheritance and how it works and polymorphism and interfaces a little bit more and there'll be some examples and it's going to be fun. <clears throat> so we'll present the fundamental concept principles that are going to I hope go with you everywhere. Pause. So we'll be talking about inheritance between classes, which is a concept you're already familiar with. Um, abstract classes and abstraction in general. Uh, we'll talk about encapsulation, which is one of the base fundamentals of, of object-oriented programming. Polymorphism, which is also a part. They're all part of the same things which derive from the implementation of classes and how they, how they are built. Um, but these already start to go into really the philosophy of, of object-oriented design and when to use what, because you can build classes in, in infinite ways. And this is starting to talk about when to use what and how to design and how to plan your code better. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about the cohesion and coupling a little bit, but these are really concepts which, um, yeah, they're not really hard in the code, um, but they are part of how you plan your code, how you design your classes. So these are the basic fundamental concepts, principles of object-oriented design and programming. So we have inheritance. Um, that we already are familiar with. We have classes that they can inherit other classes, so that will be reusing code. We'll be reusing code from other classes, from base classes. Uh, we have abstraction, so we can define um, abstract actions and abstract classes, and we'll be seeing how that works. Um, encapsulation, I keep repeating that, not just, I, I think I've mentioned it many times, when you are planning your classes, make sure that they are as much as possible alive in their own world, so that they have their own entities and they expose to the, to the outside world whatever the outside world needs, but anything else should be kept inside. And that's a base concept. So when you're planning your classes, this is a this is an important principle, and polymorphism is the concept of accessing different data through uh, different methods in different classes. But this is done for you automatically, and uh, you can access methods, and you don't really know um, until you actually execute the method. You um, you're not the the runtime environment should decide for you which class this method should be executed for. So I can actually ac reference the base class, but the method will be executed in one of the child classes. We'll see how it works. It's a, it's a basic mechanism. It exists in all the object-oriented languages. It's basic in C++, C++ um, not C, C++, C Sharp, of course. And we'll see how it works also in some examples. So the first thing is inheritance, <coughs> which, uh, which we are already familiar with, as I said. Classes in define attributes and behavior. Uh, I don't like the word attributes here. I think we've already also seen it in other, um, other sessions as well, because the word attributes um, relates to a specific concept 
uh, not concept, but it relates to a specific building block of the C-sharp language. There is something called attribute that you can decorate your methods with. But for now, for the terminology, the word attribute will have to do. They have fields, they have properties, they have methods, they can have other things, but these are the basic ones that most probably will always be there. Methods contain code for execution. We've seen them in, in, in many cases. And we have interfaces, which are something like a, something like a class without any content in it, just defining what other classes must implement uh, in this case. So inheritance, we have the parent class, which is uh, usually should be referred to as the base class. And we have deriving classes. Those are the children that implement the inheritance from the base. So again, we're running into the word attributes. And we have fields and properties in the class that those are, some of them are exposed, usually will be referred by the word property. Some of them are hidden inside the class. Those will be fields. And operations, so those are our functions, our methods, which are defined in the class. And um, I think, I don't remember, but I think we've seen already inheritance and how it works. So a child class can extend the parent class. We have the parent and the child, and everything that the child is allowed to use is automatically inherited to it. And the child, of course, can extend the parent and add its own, its own method. So that's the power of inheritance. Like we have an animal and then we can have a dog that will have all the, all the, relevant, um, all the relevant properties of animal, but it can have its own customization properties, additional ones and changed ones. This is a. This is just a, a map of the concept of the terminology. We have a base class or a parent class, and then we have a derived class, which is the inheritor. So we would say that the der derived class inherits the base class. And then we have an interface, which behaves something like a base class, but when we are implementing the interface, we say the class implements it and not inherits it because the interface is not its own object. It doesn't have its own body. It just, it's just a set of rules. And we can, have, um, we can have a hierarchy between interfaces. So we can have interfaces implementing um, other interfaces and deriving from them. So we can have a whole bunch of um, classes and interfaces working together, inheriting from each other. And that's up to you to decide which ones you're putting where. So these are the benefits of inheritance. Um, this is a, in 99% in of the projects that you'll be working on, it will be a necess necessity. Um, because in many cases we are building something like basic basic concept and then we're extending it through um, child. Um, if it's a control in Windows and there you have different controls that have um, properties like name or they could have some kind of a text title which will appear, um, but they will behave differently from each other. So they will have all common properties and the children will have their own customizations. <clears throat> so these are the benefits we have extensibility, we are adding functionality to the base. We have reusability, so you don't have to rewrite everything again and again for every class. Um, abstraction, that's a, an important concept that maybe I'll, I'll mention a little more later. And yeah, redundant code because we are, because we are using, reusing code um, in, our, in our design. Um, Again, this is also something I think probably we already know that inheritance, um, inheritance uses the is a relationship. So if we have an animal and then a dog inherits this class, then dog is a type of animal. That's, that's the idea. And not has a, which is actually relating to a property. We can say a dog has a, some kind of descriptor. 
Here's an example, the classic one. We have a person that has a name and an address. Those two are strings. Um, and we have two derived classes. One of them is employee and the other is student. And we see that both of them will both have name and address as well. But each one of them will add their own specific customized um, additional properties on top of what we already know. Um, usually the inheritance class will be something more big and, co and complex like this. Um, and yeah, you have to know pretty much keeping track and you have to organize your project in a way that you'll know which classes are related and to which, to which classes. And part of the documentation is in the many times um, providing such, a, such a, a diagram. And we'll see an example of that or, as well, of, of the classes that take part in it and how they relate, who is inheriting who, where are the interfaces and how they're implemented, what's common to the others and what's not common. Uh, <clears throat> Um, we already know that uh, in C Sharp we have we don't have multiple inheritance like in other languages, um, for example C++. Um, one thing that you can do you can implement multiple interfaces, but an interface doesn't include many of the things that the class have in them. So uh, once you define an interface, this means your class must implement a certain thing. If we're talking about inheritance, we're talking about something much much broader. And you really have to design your building blocks and your plan um, because of that, because yeah, you, can, you can derive only from one class. Here's how inheritance is done. We have a shape class and we have a circle class which derives, inherits the shape. Once we have a constructor in our class, Here's our circle class um, constructor that takes two integers, x and y. We can call, invoke the base class. And actually what we're calling here is the constructor of the base class, which has one argument of integer. So the base class should have such, such a constructor. And <clears throat> we've seen how we can make a constructor call another constructor in the same class. Have I demonstrated it or not? Um, if you have multiple constructors in the same class, you can call, you can make a constructor call another constructor by using the word this here where it says base. But if we have a hierarchy, we can call the constructor on the base class. So this will call the constructor on the base class with this signature. Here's another example. We have a class mammal, has an age, and we have a constructor that receives an age integer and populates the age property. This property has a getter and a setter. And we have a method of sleep that we can call so in this case, when we have a dog, which is a, an inheriting class, it will also support the public method of sleep, so we, like any other mammal. And it has its own properties. It has a breed, and it has a method called wagtail, which is specific for a dog. And here's our constructor. So we are invoking here the constructor with an age and a breed, so we are populating only the breed and we are calling the base class constructor with the age. So once we get here, this constructor will be invoked first and it will fill this public integer property. And then we're going to fill this property here. Yeah. If the property is private, you cannot access it. Um, you will be able to call the constructor. The constructor can do things here because in the, in the context of this class, it can access its, its members. 
but here you will not be able to address this property. <coughs> if you if it's a protected yes, uh, derived inheriting classes can access protected members or public members. So this is the way how we are keeping the properties inside of our classes. That's not the them to the property. Yes, if you want them only between the classes which are inheriting from each other, they should be uh, protected. Um, also about the accessibility of classes themselves. A class can be public and, and it can be, it can be actually a private class if it's defined inside another class. But classes have another accessor um, keyword internal. That means that they are only in their own assembly. They cannot access other classes in other. Um, they cannot be accessed by um, other assemblies. But in the inside the class, we have public, private, and protected. And that's how we hide whatever the world doesn't need to know in our, in our class. Okay. So So here's our the same class that we've seen with the same constructor and the same method. It's normal to separate them into um, separate files in the project. Um, actually, whenever you add a new class, you'll get a new file added. And it will already add it, be added. Um, its namespace will be according to its location in the project. And we'll get a class with a name which corresponds with the file name. And here we have the second class, the dog, which inherits. Here we're calling the base constructor. And here's a simple example. Oh. So let's run it. So we are creating a new instance of the dog class. We're calling the constructor. And <coughs> here we are going to invoke the parent base class constructor. So we're going to go here, populate the age property with the age given. And then we're going to go back to the original constructor of dog, run it, and we're going to get the dog object with both properties populated. We can see the properties which are, which are coming directly from the class, and we can see the base class properties here. So you can get the hierarchy of where your properties are coming from. Now we're calling the sleep method, which is defined in the mammal in the base class, but since it's public method, we can, you, we can invoke it. The wagtail, which is a method of the dog. Let's remove this. And printing out the two properties in a formatted string to the, to the screen. Questions more about this? Mm, they are also um, they sh they are also accessible when you have the inheritance. I mean, if we define a static, you mean a static me member here and the of the base class? Yes, should be accessing it. Sorry, this is the instance. Yeah. 
So this is a static property coming from the parent class. The same rules apply. More about this? What is the type of object that involves the sleep method? Is it the memo or the dot? Well, the sleep method in this example <coughs> exists only in the base class. So when we invoke it, it's only going there. Dog doesn't have its own version of this method. So if you uh, use the this keyword in the uh, sleep method, we will get a reference to the memo. Yes, you mean if I address it here, for example, inside one of my methods here. Yes, it will run the memo method. <clears throat> More? You just created the sleep input. Hmm? You just created the sleep input. Yes, and went away. <clears throat> Putting a dog to sleep. Not, not exactly. <coughs> so um, here again, uh, the modifier, the, acce the accessor modifiers that we just mentioned. So we have the public, whatever is public. It's like Facebook. Whatever you put there, don't be, you can't be surprised that somebody is doing something with it. <coughs> so yeah, whatever is public is public. And keep your privates private. So private in a class is really private. Nobody can access it except the class um, itself. So keep the world on what they need to know. And what they don't need to know, keep to yourself. Protected works across inheritance. Um, <clears throat> in C++, there is another, there's another way to share uh, properties between classes. It's called friends. And in C-sharp, we don't have that. Uh, you could define a class to be a friend of another class, and they will share their protected uh, properties and, and methods, too. And C-sharp, no friends. Friends in Facebook. Um, if you do want to restrict uh, the accessibility of classes, you'll most usually uh, use the internal keyword. Um, which limits the access to the assembly only. So this works for properties, it works for classes as well. You can define, prop you can define um, things which are basically as if they are public, but they cannot be accessed on an external assembly. So if your project have multiple assemblies, you can dedicate specific assemblies to specific tasks, and if you need to hide certain information, you can still hide it inside your assembly and the classes will still be able to access it among themselves, but only inside your, the same assembly. And when you're creating a new class, without specifying anything, the default will be internal. And when you're creating a new property or a method inside a class, the default will be private, unless you specify something else. And you can uh, combine, of course, protected and internal. So in this case, only derived classes in the same assembly will be accessing your data. <coughs> so that gives quite a lot of control of what you're exposing. Um, that's important. Here again, we have inheritance of a, we're going to the base class of mammal. It's called creature. <coughs> And creature has a private method called talk. So if we inherit this mammal, uh, mammal class from creature, we will not be able to call the talk method. <coughs> and yeah, also here the name uh, property has a getter and a setter, but the, the setter is private. That means it's accessible only to be set inside this class. Um, if we're trying to set this from the mammal class, it will be impossible. It's a read-only in this context. Let's 
So again, we're inheriting dog from mammal, and we have a breed which can only be get, we can get it only to the outside, and we can set it only here. We cannot invoke any private methods, and these are again the same examples of what you can and what you can't. So let's see it in code, it will be better. <coughs> so our base class creature has a name it's protected. That means that we have here the constructor, the public constructor, and we are given a name while we're creating the object. And <clears throat> we are populating this property. We can do it because we are in the same class. And we're, we're using the keyword this, which is um, good to use. Whenever you are addressing properties and methods in your own class, use the word this. It will be much clearer in the code. This is not the class. This is the current instance of the class. So when we're creating uh, an object of type creature, the words this inside the methods will refer to the, this specific instance that we've created. So in this case, we are referring to the current the current context that we're creating. We're setting the name property. And from that time on, whoever wants to access it from the outside can get it only as a read-only property. Inside the class, of course, it's accessible. We can do whatever we want. <coughs> and we have one private method talk. Um, these green lines that are coming from uh, um, the extension that I'm using for Visual Studio called Just Code, which is a Telerik product, um, tell me that it's like an unused variable. In this case, it's an unused method. It's not used anywhere in the code, and the only place that it can be used is in this class, and nobody's using it. Nobody's calling it anywhere. So this is a lonely private method that nobody uses and not many people can use it because it's private. And we have the walk method which is protected so we can use it in the inheriting classes. And then we have the mammal. Which inherits the creature. Has its own age. We're calling here the base constructor to provide the name. So this is uh, pretty much like what you asked <coughs> previously, because we have a name which is, its setting is private, so we cannot set it from here, but the constructor that we're calling will set it for us, and we're setting our own additional properties. That's a, <coughs> that's a good practice when you have inheritance like this. Um, to set your own properties, whatever comes from the base class, in many cases, let the base class handle it. I mean, it brings much more, much more clear structure of what's happening. <coughs> and the sleep method here also uses the name which comes from the base class. And then we have a dog which inherits mammal. So it has its own properties, breed, and what happens here is that we're supplying three properties, name, age, and breed, and we are calling first the base constructor of the parent mammal, and it will, in its, in its turn, will call the, its base class constructor of creature. So again, we're setting our own property. This is again a private set property. And we have our own method wagtail, which is specific for a dog. <coughs> so here again, the construction, 
and the methods that we can and cannot call, I, I hope it's clear now what we can call when, right? Uh, the privates and the protected ones. So just to see the chain of construction, we're creating a new instance. So we're calling first the dog constructor, the dog constructor calls the base constructor. So we're going to the, a, to the mammal constructor. And the mammal constructor calls the creature constructor, so we're going there. So first we're <coughs> setting the name on the topmost base class. Then we're going back to the inheriting intermediate class, setting the age. Then we're going back to the dog class and we're setting the breed. So in the end, this dog will have all the properties and they are in the hierarchy of the inheritance. So we're calling the sleep method, which is um, <coughs> in the intermediate class. It can be for any mammal, but it cannot be called for a creature. And here we're calling the wagtail, which is specific for the dog class. Um, on any of these lines that, that say this will not compile, <coughs> we'll get errors when we're trying to access what we shouldn't. Um, questions? More? What um what do you mean? For example here we we are setting first the name, which is in the future class, mm -hmm. then we're setting the age, which is in the uh, memo class, and then after that we're setting the brief. If we are doing it uh for example group briefs, then memo and uh name is going to be wrong or you mean the order of the yes. of the arguments in the constructor? It doesn't matter. Um, it depends on your implementation. And in some cases, you want certain arguments to appear first because they are more basic and more important to you. The, the order doesn't matter because they are going by name. <coughs> so, but, but the call sequence will be like we saw it here. It will go to the base class first and run it. And if this one is calling the base, it will go to the base class of the base class first. And then we'll start coming back. We are sending a string and an integer. If it was two strings and we were going to the base class in this case, it will go to the constructor and it will set them by the order. You have to, yeah, you have to keep the order. I think, okay, I got what you're asking. The order here is as it is defined in the constructor of the base. So when I write it, I will get some help. The IntelliSense. Uh, no, no. I get the signature of the method, no matter if I have documentation. I can see the which argument is which. Mm, just like calling any other method. So the order here will be defined in the base class. It doesn't have to be necessarily corresponding to the order here. These are two different methods and they have they can have different structure and different order of parameters, but that's really up to you. It's a uh, it is good practice to keep them in the same order in these cases, or at least when you have overloading um, constructors with different arguments. So you can have constructor with zero, the default. You can, you can have a constructor with, for example, I can define another constructor here. That could be the default constructor. 
Why am I getting this? Is there already? has to be defined in the base. So there let's... No hmm? no yes, yes. That's because yes, we are... We don't get the future. Um, but still... Why are we getting this? Hmm. I am in the dog class. Mm. Yeah, but in this case... I think it will try to, yeah, it will probably try to create an instance of the base. And this is the reason we're getting this. Yes and no, in this case we have different constructors in them. This one has only a name and this one has a name and an age. But in the case that we define an empty one, we should be able to create a dog class. It goes directly to the inheritor. Probably because they need the default constructor of their own as well. So <coughs> And you have to plan which constructors are included and I think they have to be also covered in a hierarchical structure um, in this case but I'll, I'll check it in Probably. <clears throat> but um, one way around it is to call your own constructor in this case. So that I can define additional criteria here. <coughs> yeah, if I want a default constructor in this case, like this, it will have to go through the inheritance. Sorry? One time when we create any any of the constructors, we are using the core construction for this process. You can still use it. You can have multiple constructors and one of them can be the default like this. Yeah. If we create one, the default one. Mm, if you don't define a default one, then yeah, you will need <coughs> 
Yeah, that's, that's actually true. In this case, now I can invoke either one of the two constructors, but if I don't have a default constructor, I have only one option here. So we have to always make more important. Actually, if we want to, if we need for sure to set the properties for the class, then we have to It's up to you whether you want to supply a default constructor or not. <coughs> in some cases, you don't want to be able to call the constructor without any arguments. And that's up to you. One other way um, to do it, if you have a default constructor, So here I'm getting an object, and I can set its properties, its public properties only in this case. Or at least the ones that I'm allowed. Actually, I don't think I'm allowed to set any of them because they're all read-only. Or age, actually. Age has a get and a set which are public, but that's OK. <coughs> And another notation for that could be putting it inside block right after the constructor. And breed, I think I can't set. Oh, I can. Are they all public? Private set. So this should not work. Yeah. But that's another way to um, <coughs> that's another way to populate your prop class properties is to call the default constructor and then put a block like this to populate them. But then you can access only the public ones. And this is this is not really the equivalent of a of calling a constructor that will do the work for you and call the other constructors on in, in time. So whether you have a default constructor in your class or not is up to you. And, uh, uh, what about using namespaces? Namespaces. What about that? Yes, namespaces just are just family names of your class. So you can call, there's no problem working in two separate namespaces as long as <coughs> you're co either calling the class with its full name, so in this case the class dog, but they have no namespaces here, but um, I can add a namespace. And in this case, now I cannot really see the dog class, but I can either say using, or I can call the class by its full name. I can say using animals, or I can say animals.dog. But then every time that you access the class, you have to do it. But namespaces are are good for organizing, again, your, your classes in a, <coughs> at least in a logical way. Um, and it's also quite important. And there's no, they're not limiting you. 
All you have to do is add the right using statements. So Not related to namespaces. <coughs> okay. Um, if you remember structures, um, structures are not inheritable. They are basically behaving like classes, <coughs> although we've talked about uh, their different uh, memory management, which is um, not the same as classes, basically. But in functional programming, they are used as, as if they are classes, and they cannot be inherited. Uh, as I mentioned, there is no multiple inheritance in C-sharp. You can in, in, in inherit only one class. And um, inheritance is transitive. So just like we saw here, when you have a hierarchy of inheritance, um, like the creature and mammal and then dog, um, those are going all the way down the hierarchy. So if C is derived from B and B is derived from A, then C is derived from A as well. Whatever is inherited from A will get it also at the bottom layer. Um, don't think we have something new here. Oh, we have. Um, that's actually quite an important, important feature of inheritance, um, which is very, very powerful and useful. As we've seen, we have methods in all of our classes. We have methods in our base class, and we have methods in our derived class. And for example, we can call the sleep method if all the creatures can sleep. We can have a method called sleep on the base class, and any of the deriving objects can call the sleep method. Um, however, it could be that uh, different animals will implement sleeping in a different way. So we can define a method in the base class, and then we can define, redefine the same method on the deriving classes, changing what we need. Um, so they will have the same methods with the same structure, with the same signature, with the same name, um, but they will behave differently. Um, this is important. This is used by using the virtual word, keyword. And once we have a virtual method in our class, that will be in our base class, we can override them and we can implement the overriding in, in different ways. Um, for example, all the classes um, implement the object class and equals is a comparison method which is accessible to all the objects because it comes from the most basic base class in the language. But it's implemented, it could be implemented in different ways on any, other, on any class that we want to compare. Or, for example, toString is also a method which, is, um, which can be called on any class, but it can be implemented in different ways when we're calling an integer toString and when we're calling a string toString, for example. We'll get two different implementations. So this allows you to get flexible when you are creating methods in, yeah. Can we A derived class. I mean, if I have uh, a method in the base class, the file is protected. Mm -hmm. Can we override the same method in the derived class? To yes, the but it has to be defined as virtual. You cannot override it. No, I mean, if you have a detected method in the base class, mm -hmm. can we have the same method with the public description? 
or uh, the restriction? Hmm. Be I think the restriction stays. You cannot change it. I think so. Yes. We'll, we'll check it. <coughs> I think we should have an example with that, and if not, um, we'll see it. So, abstraction um, is the concept that means that um, we want our classes, again, to have whatever they need to have. And we can base certain classes on other classes or on interfaces. Um, <coughs> but the more we go higher in the hierarchy, we will need to have um, the more basic, which relates to the, to the more basic implementation. And every class needs to have their own, like it says here, relevant properties and, me and um, properties and, and methods. So, um, again, when we're talking about hierarchy, just I think the key here is to think about what your class, what is relevant for the class which is managed at your, at your level. I think there are some examples here that, uh, so, um, for example, we've seen the person class, which has a name. So this is relevant for every, every person. And once we inherit it, all the deriving objects will have it. Um, but you should distribute your properties according to where they need to be. Um, so in that case, as we go up the hierarchy, we're getting more and more basic in our implementation, more and more basic properties, and more and more to the, to the abstract. So less and less to the concrete. Less, we're going less <coughs> to, um, to concrete examples of the class. Um, hope it will get more clear. For example, um, like I mentioned, if we're talking about controls in, <coughs> in Windows, or we can talk about controls in, in ASP.NET on the web, so we can have a base class of controls, and every control will have a click method. And then we can have all kinds of buttons, but we can put a, a base class, which we call button base, that could have, for example, a color, and then we can implement separate types of buttons, which are all based on the button base and on the control. They will all have those properties, but putting the right ones, which are common in the right places, which are relevant, um, is, is the important part here. And also, in certain cases, we need to say what the buttons do but we could implement those in different ways. And we could just specify here um, that every button needs to have a click method, or any other control needs to have a click method, but should be implemented differently for different buttons. So this kind of abstraction, um, just saying what you need and then implementing it, could be achieved by abstract classes that we haven't touched yet and interfaces that is interface as we've seen is just a list of what the class must have um, abstract classes are meant to be only base classes and you cannot actually create um, an object from an abstract class it will define a structure just like an interface does mm -hmm. but it cannot be implemented just like an interface although there are differences between them, and I'll mention those in a moment. <coughs> and inheritance is, of course, the one way of abstraction, but we can define the properties we need at the right level that we need them. And as we go up, we go more abstract, and as we go down, we go more, more and more concrete into our needs. OK. 
Okay, here's, an, uh, here's actually the same example. We have the system object, which is the base class of all the objects and all the classes um, in the .NET framework. <coughs> then we have some kind of reference object, which is called Marshall by ref object, which inherits from that one. And we have the component model, and we have a class called component. Then we have a control, which inherits from that. Then we have a button base, which inherits from that. And then we have a button, which inherits from that. And on each of those levels, we're getting what we need for that level. And it defines, it could define what will be needed on the next in implementing ones um, if they want to inherit or implement it. <clears throat> so interfaces, uh, we've seen them, they just so define what the class that implements it must have. So that's why it's sometimes also called a contract. And in some parts of the language, the word contract is actually used. For example, uh, if we're talking about web services, um, <clears throat> when we are defining any kind of service between two parties that need to communicate with each other, they could just know that each side of them have support for specific methods and in the world of WCF services this is really referred to as a contract between the two sides. Uh, once we have an interface and we have a class that implements this interface we can be sure that this class implements specific methods. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So the abstraction here is, per, is, is achieved by the, way that, by the fact that, that we know what the class must implement. We are sure about that. Um, but the implementation itself is not really, doesn't really matter, I mean, at the top level. We have the interface. The interface doesn't care how you're going to implement your things. You can gen change your implementation inside the class but still, to the outside looker of your class, it will still appear as the same interface, and they can still be sure that these methods are supported. So for the external user of your class, it keeps whatever they need for their class um, exposed, and the internal implementation is um, for, the in, for the developer of the class itself. Um, they can define, um, they, they can also define properties, uh, no constructors in interfaces. And if you need more than that, uh, more than just that, um, you can use an abstract class. Um, we'll see what they define and what's the difference between them two. <coughs> so an abstract class is something like an interface, but it's more like a class. So once you define an abstract class, you can define whatever you want inside it, um, including abstract methods, which means that you are not really implementing them at all. It's just like the interface defining. There's a, there should be a method here, but there, this method has no body. This method will be implemented by the inheritor. <coughs> um, so uh, the the difference between an abstract class and a regular class is that you cannot create an instance of an abstract class. You're not allowed to do that. You can only inherit from it if you want to create objects based on it. <clears throat> so it, it creates some kind of, again, a template, which is some kind of base that if we know that you're deriving from this class, it will have certain implementations, um, just like the interface says, um, but some of them can be implemented and some of them um, are not. If something is defined in the abstract class and your class is, implement is inheriting an abstract class, then the user of your class can know that this class implements those methods because they are there. They are either inherited or they are abstract and then you have to implement them. Uh, 
In abstract methods, there isn't any code, but you can have regular methods in abstract classes, but you cannot use them directly because the class cannot be instantiated. Uh, so, for example, I think not. As soon as you use the abstract keyword in some class, you should find the class is abstract. I think that, yeah, I think that's the case. You could have an abstract class without any abstract method, but uh, if you have a, at least one abstract method, you should use the keyword abstract in the first definition. Yeah, if this class, <coughs> um, if this class was abstract, this means that from now on I cannot create a creature directly. I can create new methods here. I can either define them as, as regular methods or I can define them as abstract. And then they will have no body of their own. Hmm? Yeah, once the method is abstract, it cannot have a body. But once we implement, once we have here a class that implements it, it will have to supply implementation for the basic method. Otherwise, it will not build. And if I have an abstract member in a class, this means this class cannot be instantiated because you cannot create an instance of this class and this method will be just an empty stub. So this will not make any sense. That's why the class itself, in this case, must be abstract as well. So that's the error we're getting here. <clears throat> On the other hand, the class can be abstract without any abstract methods in it. You can really implement it fully, but in this case, you cannot, you cannot just instantiate it. The object? The object, the network object, it's not an abstract object because you can create it. Right? You can inherit it and you can, you can create um, an object instance. But, um, <coughs> but in some cases, you want to define some classes which are base ones, but you don't want people to directly use them. So. They should be there as just as in the same abstraction as interfaces are there. You cannot create an instance of them, but they will make sure that your implementers have what you've defined. So the difference between the interfaces and the abstract class is that abstract class you can have a method, so so anything that Yeah, it can have really everything, but it's a it's a class. Yeah. But it cannot be instantiated. There are other differences that we'll go over in a moment. <coughs> so the abstract data types, um, abstract classes or interfaces are defining a set of operations, um, a set of things which are defined in the base and then you can be sure that the users have what they need. Um, this is, these two slides are a small list um, about the differences between cla abstract classes and interfaces. <coughs> so, um, as we've seen in interfaces, we have multiple implementation of interfaces, but once you inherit a class, it's always a one-to-one -one inheritance, whether the class is abstract or not. Um, the class can have default implementation, it can have um, it can have really methods and 
properties and everything could be implemented in it. It could have some of the methods abstract and some are not. But I think these are reversed. I might have put them reversed. Um, <coughs> interface can, cannot provide any code, just the signatures of the methods that you are using. Um, again, uh, one more thing which is important, once you define an interface, um, the interface defines the things which are accessible to the users of your class. That's why it's called a contract. So in the interface itself, you cannot put any, um, you cannot put any accessor def definitions. You cannot say this method should be private or protected. Um, they are assumed to be always public. Um, in an abstract class, you can do whatever you want, and you can modify the access um, to any of your properties or methods as you need. <coughs> um, <coughs> um, as for... Uh, abstract... Th this is more like what we've been talking about so far. <coughs> the fact that an interface is just a definition of what the class must implement and what the class must support. An abstract class is more an idea of a class that has some kind of base of your child classes. So it really defines a certain type with a certain behavior, with a certain implementation. The fact that it's abstract is now beside the point. But interface is just, just says what's needed to be, to be there. Um, and also, since interfaces are, are, are contracts in a way, um, and since we have to implement everything, um, the interface doesn't implement anything, once you add something or remove something from an interface, uh, you have to go through, if you have 10 classes that implement this interface, you have to then go to all these classes and add the new method to each one of them um, manually, um, which is something which is uh, usually done. Sometimes if your interface users are external projects or customers, who expect something, and then you change the interface, their code will break too. That's, again, the equivalence of interfaces and contracts. Um, abstract classes can behave much more flexible. In this case, you can add some things, and it just behaves like a base class. So if you have a method, you can implement it on the, on the base, and your inheritors will have it. <coughs> And uh, fields, since the fields and constants are not part of an interface, only properties and methods, um, they're not supported by interfaces, but they can be added to an abstract class just like to any other class. <coughs> um, Many times um, when we are working on a big project, um, <coughs> we'll need to provide documentation. And in many times, our project will be very big in using many classes and interfaces and abstracts in inheriting from each other. And a good way to map what's going on is to use uh, UML diagrams, uniform modeling language. It has a few types of diagrams um, which map, for example, how operations are done or what is, the, um, what is the sequence of operations inside a specific method. Um, the most common case of using UML diagrams is for using them to, def to show which classes we have and how they're using each other, what their properties are. It gives a good mapping and sometimes it's just as complex as the project itself. Hmm? Yes, this is part of architecture. Sometimes you'll have to just sit and define it yourself. Uh, before you start even building the classes, you'll have to start thinking which classes I'm going to need, um, how am I going to abstract them, who's going to in inherit from who, 
which interfaces are going to be used and where we're going to need them. Um, so in, in many cases when you're building something big this will be a good thing to start with. Um, if not, uh, Visual Studio of course gives the tools to, to create those based on the classes that you've already created. So <coughs> we can see um, we can see here that we have interfaces. We have the interface and those dotted arrows shows that those two classes, square and rectangle, are implementing the interface and they're both also inheriting the shape class. And the shape class has a point which is a, uh, defined here as a separate class and it has a member of type point. And now we have a filled square and filled rectangle which are inheriting from square and rectangle and uh, they also have a member which is a structure of type color each one of them so that's a simple example to show uh, yeah who is against who Let me close the others first. Just to keep them. <coughs> so this is what the diagram would look in Visual Studio. You have a set of tools We have a set of tools in the toolbox that we can we can add things to the to the class to the diagram. That's one way. Another way is to create your own diagram, and that is, for example, if we go back to the previous project, and we'll add a new item to the project. This will be uh, class diagram. We'll give it a name. And what you can do is take your classes and drag them in and you will see the structure <coughs> and you can extend expand to see the properties of each of the objects which is a This is not like 3ds Max, <coughs> but there is a there is a more robust uh, tool called Enterprise Architect, which uh, which is specifically for software architects to start building all kinds of diagrams, taking them from documentation or creating documentation from them. <coughs> so, if you are updating something and you want to refresh the diagram, I don't know of any trick except. Uh, closing it and opening it again. So if I go to the dog class and I add some new property to it, it has a read. Um, if I reload it, I should see the new property here. <coughs> Let's go back to the more complex one. <coughs> so
So we see that we have a shape and we have the class, the struct in this case, point, and this class has a member position which is of type point. Um, we can switch here on this relation. We can say, show it as a property of the class like this, or we can say, show it as a relation to the other class so that we can see that this property is actually related to this, to this structure. So we can see the methods, we can see the properties. <coughs> we can go from here to the code. We can see the, those are interfaces. And all the notation and um, shapes here are the standard UML ways that they're supposed to be. <clears throat> so this helps a lot in both uh, designing your project and documenting it and mapping what's going on. Of the .NET framework, the whole framework. I would look it up online, but uh, uh, maybe there is. What about that? If you get a higher version of Visual Studio? You get a code. You get a page with printed all the inheritance uh, always oh. the plus diagrams uh, starting from object and uh, how we inherit it. Quite big, but I didn't see it. I never really bought any software, but uh, I even uh, Mm, yeah, for such a vast thing, which is also all the time changing, uh, the best thing is to go to the documentation and find yourself. I mean, if you have to use a certain class, you go to the documentation, you'll see where it's coming from, what's it in inheriting, you can go up the hierarchy. It will be, I think, more useful than seeing yourself in a huge, huge diagram with hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, squares. So I don't know if there is a one here, but I'm sure you can find something like that. Um, but mm -hmm. Sorry? I mean, people are doing all kinds of things that are, uh, let's say, they are curious and they are trying to do other things. So I think even if Microsoft is not providing this diagram for the product, somebody will do it. Somebody else. Uh, yeah, for, for themselves, you mean. Uh, yeah, you also uh, at least partially, I guess, in some parts of it. Okay, if we're going to controls or to some part of, of the framework which has a a subsection of the classes, then yes, it would make more more sense, but I don't know if we have one of such infinity. I should check if we have yeah, you don't know if it's a I you should check. Mm, we have it probably in doc in documentation at least partially, but I mean whether we have a, a diagram with the whole all the classes of the project I I would doubt it for the same reason because there are too many you can just stop. You can stop. Hmm? You can just stop. 
the yes, yes, we we have we have all kinds of diagrams, class diagrams and sequence diagrams, and in every new feature we we would usually try to plan it in advance to see what we're going to do. But uh, putting it together for the whole project is unlikely. <coughs> so this is about diagrams. Encapsulation. Um, once again, like I mentioned, let your world get what they need and no more than that. So it's common practice and it's good practice that if you have data in your class, keep it in private properties that are fields. And then access those properties through public properties. So you can have a field. <clears throat> and then you have a property which returns the value of this field or sets the value of this field. Um, it would be unlikely to have, for example, a class with a string name and that's it. Um, it would usually be some kind of public property with hiding behind it a private field. So you can manipulate data when it comes in and when it comes out and you can control who can access it and and how. Interfaces, as we've mentioned, are always public because they are representing the connection of your class with the world. So in this case, for example, the person class will have public properties of name and age. They will have a getter and a setter method. <coughs> we'll have a constructor. And we can hold behind those properties, um, private fields with the same names. Usually the private ones will have lowercase letters and the public ones will have uppercase letters. Um, and in those getters and setters or in the constructor or whenever we need to manipulate this data, we can decide when we're going to do it. And only the class itself will access them and manage them. So don't expose data unless you think the world will need it. And when you do it, you can always wrap it in, a, in such a way that there is a second level of indirection to the data. So the fields are always private and the public properties um, can have read-only or read-write mode, depends on your needs. <coughs> Constructors are almost always declared as public. There are some special cases of uh, non-public constructors. Um, for example, when you need to control on uh, how many instances of your class are there, you can create some kind of static accessor to your class, which will call the constructor in within itself. And this is a common, um, common, uh, design pattern called singleton. So constructors are almost always declared public unless you have a good reason not to have it public. <coughs> interface members are always public. You don't write the word public inside an interface, but whenever your class implements it, it has to be public because that's the whole idea of, of interfaces. So, again, encapsulation hides from the world what the world doesn't need to know. And <clears throat> this also goes not only for the data members that you are keeping, but also on how you're managing them. So if your class has a certain method and then you want to change the way it manages a certain data uh, in itself, or if it implements an interface and the world expects it to have some method in it, it, it shouldn't really care about the implementation and how you really manage the, the things inside. So keep your data close.
polymorphism. I think we have not much more, right? And we have a lot. If you want, we can take a quick break now just to refresh and and we'll can we'll finish that after. So we're talking about the the next concept in object oriented design <coughs> which is uh, the polymorphism. Um, and that's the idea that we can refer to specific functions or specific properties and actually they can come from separate classes, they could come from the base and they could come from the derived classes and they can come from an interface and the user doesn't always have to know exactly where they're coming from. This whole implementation could be quite dynamic and the, the idea is that I can hold a certain class, for example, referencing the base of all my objects and I can call s different methods but they will be called through, I can call a specific method and the implementation will be dynamic according to the actual concrete object that I'm holding. <coughs> so um, we've seen the abstract classes and we mentioned the virtual methods um, that can be defined in regular classes. And um, the idea here again is just this thing gives quite a flexibility to the users of your classes and they can invoke operations uh, based on the um, interface. So for example, an interface can define um, specific methods and all the classes that implement this interface will have to implement this method with the same signature. Um, we're returning the same value type. But uh, if I'm using a collection of objects that I know that they're all using, implementing this interface, I can call this method on each one of them, but they can come from different classes that implement the interface and they can have different implementations. <laughs> and I'm just calling a specific method by its name and the implementation is encapsulated in each one of those classes. But the idea is that I'm using the same method name to run different class uh, implementations, um, different method implementations on different classes. So that's, um, that's the idea here. So virtual methods, um, as mentioned, are defined on the base class. So we're using the word, the keyword virtual. And whenever we're implementing a new version of this method, we will use the word override to create overriding methods um, in, the be in the inheriting classes. Um, <coughs> so overriding creates a new um, implementation which is overriding the base class. We can also call the base implementation from our, from our overriding methods. Um, <coughs> the, the method has to be virtual and you cannot override static methods because they are, um, they are not related to the object that you're holding. They are at the class level and they are not, they cannot be, <coughs> they cannot be overridden. Um, polymorphism ensures that the appropriate method of the subclass is called. So again, we can say that this object that I'm holding now implements <coughs> the interface and I'm calling the method based on the fact that it implements the interface. Uh, where it goes and how it's implemented in the class itself doesn't matter. And if I have separate classes, separate objects, they can implement it in a different way, but I can still call them in the same uniform way because they are supporting the same contract that, uh, that is expected from them. So here we have a figure class and this will be an abstract base class to the others and we have a calc surface 
method to calculate the surface of the figure, which will return a double, and that's an abstract action. And now we're creating a concrete class of square and a concrete class of circle. And since this is an abstract method, it has to be implemented, and they can both implement it in different ways. So if it's a circle, we're calculating pi times radius square. And of course, the circle has those properties. If it's a square, then we have the size of the square, and we're just returning the size times size. So the, the implementation is different between the two classes. Here's the class, the base class, the figure abstract, and here's the abstract method, and here's the overriding method on the square. But look what's going on here. We have two objects, F1 and F2, and they are both of type figure. But since I cannot create an instance of figure because it's abstract, I'm creating actual instances of the inheriting concrete classes. <coughs> it's allowed because figure is a is a common parent of both classes and it can be addressed as as a common parent. So now I can call F1 calc surface and I can call F2 calc surface. Those will be those again, those are two objects which are declared as the same type and I'm calling the same method, but actually the implementation will call calc surface in different implementations. So even though these two look the same and these two look the same, they will behave differently. So our abstract class has nothing in it but an abstract method definition of calc surface. We have a circle. <coughs> with its radius. <coughs> and we have our overriding calc surface method. We have a rectangle with height and width and its own overriding. We have a square with its own overriding. And actually here is a <coughs> an example just like the one we've seen, just a little more interesting I think. We have a collection of objects, an array of figures, and each one of the figures in the array is initialized according to its specific properties and creating different object types. They still are all of type figure because they are inheriting it. And we're going on our array, we're iterating through it in a loop. And for each one of the shapes, we're calling calc surface. So for each one of them, will be going to the right in method implementation according to its concrete um, implementation. You can see it. Here's our array. And each one of the types has its own properties. And right now, there will be the square. So when we're going to call First, we're going to get the type to print out what type we're holding. So we'll print the class name, and we're going to just... I don't think we can step into that, but we'll step into the calc surface method. So this one is related to a square. And on the next iteration, we'll go to the calc surface of a circle. So this loop doesn't know 
what it's handling. It knows that it's handling figures. Those can come from the outside um, user of your method. They can say, okay, I need, I need a collection of figures here, and I don't care what they are. I just call the method that I know that figure has, or for example, the method get type that all of them have because it's in the base class called object. <coughs> Um, and that's it, we don't care. The implementation is polymorphic, it's completely dynamic at runtime in this case. So Another example, <coughs> um, for example, we'll look at the Windows Calculator application, which is um, produced of controls like radio buttons and buttons. Here we have a menu, we have the title, we have some text box here which is being filled. So the calculator consists of controls. We have the buttons and the panels and the text boxes and the menus and all those. Um, <clears throat> and since they're all controls, they all inherit a base class in, at some point of their hierarchy called control. Um, and this control has I paintable. Um, it, it's, it should implement the I paintable, which supplies a method called paint. And what this means is that every control can implement paint in a different way, and it can paint itself on the screen differently. So if we have a button that calls paint, it will create a square, we'll fill it, it will type some title inside it. And if it's a radio button, it will produce a circle and then put the title on the side. They, can know, they know for themselves how to produce themselves. But if I have a collection of such controls and I know that they support the iPaintable interface, then I, can, I know that I can call paint for any of them and they will know what to do for themselves. <clears throat> so these common properties of controls can also be accessed, uh, like the size, the text, the font, background color, and all the rest. So this is all about um, abstracting them as controls and not really caring and calling the basic methods, uh, for example, of paint that will produce the, the data on screen as it's supposed to. So the calculator itself um, is a form, uh, a wind form in this case. A Windows form is just a container that um, is also a type of control. And it's just a collection of child controls. So the, con the container, when it needs to print itself out, it just goes through the controls and paints them each one of them calling the paint method. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are, again, um, examples of uh, common properties, like uh, where the button can be pressed. So we should have a press method for, for buttons or for checkboxes. So you have to know um, which classes you're going to need, what common implementations or what common characteristics they're going to need, what common properties and, and methods they, they're going to need to support. And according to that, you can group them and you can abstract them um, when you go in the hierarchy of inheritance. <clears throat> so we could define an abstract button class and have all the the needed stuff there and um, and then all the buttons could inherit and implement implement it actually and use things which are basic to all the buttons at once in the abstract class but you don't want them to create this abstract button class because it's quite meaningless you will probably want the users to create real buttons that can be well defined <clears throat> so
So here's the example. Here we have the eye paintable interface with the method paint. This means that from now on, control implements this, uh, this interface. From now on, all the classes from here down will have to have a paint method. It could be defined on the base class um, as some kind of virtual function and then overridden in, this, in the deriving classes. It could be a non-virtual. In any case, these classes all need to support it. So once we have a control, we can have some kind of, for example, abstract button that defines all the buttons need. And then we can define different types of buttons, which are all deriving from the abstract. Or we can have other controls, which are all defined and um, deriving from controls. Or if we have a container, we can have containers that have um, contain other controls inside them. So for example, a form is one of them, and a calculator is a, actually um, a more concrete implementation of a form or a panel that could be placed inside a form as a collection of, of other controls. So this is what it usually is structured like. Yeah, the implementation is inside those classes, but this is uh, something to take into account when you come to build, for example, um, a, an application that has some kind of user interface. In many cases, you'll have to create your own controls um, to, to decide which controls are based on others and which controls contain others. Um, not just about controls, of course, but it's just more structured and graphic when we're talking about controls. <coughs> but this is not implementation. This is just a class structure diagram. This, I guess, you will have to do um, for example, in the calculator class. So the calculator class is a container of controls, but when you click some one of them, you can use the event where the user clicked this control, because I know that it's a control, and it, has a, it could be a button that has an event of clicking, and I can identify it because it's one of my properties, is this control. And I, then I can decide what I'm going to do about that. So I have, as a calculator, I am a form, which means I'm a container, which means I have a collection of controls inside. And one of them could be buttons. So I can search for the specific buttons and decide what to do when the user clicks this and what to do when the users click that. That's the actual implementation, which is going oh, um, already concrete to the, to, the, to the lowest level of the in inheritance. <coughs> But of course, uh, the, the calculator, again, we're talking about abstraction. So the calculator cares only if someone clicks one of the buttons. But the button itself will have to know how to handle a user click and how to recognize it and what to do about it and how to tell the other classes, somebody clicked me. So the implementation is really it's huge and it depends how deep you want to go into it but in many cases you'll just use other classes like you use the button class and you know what it's supposed to be doing uh, you're not diving deeper into it it just gives you either an interface or it gives you um, the specification of the type and what's it included in it so in, in this case the implementation is really all over the place. But if you're talking about the calculator itself, what it kno knows how to do to calculate, that will be probably down here somewhere. Um, cohesion and coupling. <coughs> um, I think it's our last topic for today. And it's again pretty much covering the same things that we've been talking about so far. Um, The, the idea here is that when you have 
multiple classes in your project and <clears throat> or not in your project when you whenever you're using multiple classes um, you should keep them as separate entities as as possible that means that they give to the world what the world needs to know but classes that refer to other classes inside their implementation is something bad um, so this is the first point here the cohesion describes how closely all the routines in a class um, support a central purpose that means keep your class implementation centralized and keep it as a as much as possible as a black box um, this of course goes on with the polymorphism that we talked about and it it, it works with the uh, encapsulation that we mentioned <clears throat> but also the the thought about the implementation itself like which methods this class needs to support and how is it going to relate to other classes classes in general don't need to know much about each other unless they have a good reason for that um, otherwise they become dependent on each other which is the second thing which we'll be um, showing, uh, talking about, which is called coupling, which is pretty much the opposite. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, um, what we see here are real-world examples of if we have a good cohesion, that means that my unit is a closed box in itself. It knows how to perform certain actions and it doesn't really interact with the outside world except a certain interface, for example, this connection that we have here. Or, let's say, this uh, CD-ROM drive that can be put some input, in this case it will be a CD, and it will have some output in the cables that are connecting it to the computer. But everything it needs are in itself and it has some kind of interface to connect with the outside world. Otherwise, when classes start to intermingle with each other, you'll get spaghetti code, um, which is, by the way, um, yeah, comes from the old world of when computers used to be really switched between loads and loads of cables, and programming used to be um, connecting loads and loads of cables. Um, it really used to be something like spaghetti. <coughs> so keep your classes neat. That's, that's the whole um, idea here. For example, we have the math class. So math class is uh, supporting all kinds of uh, static methods in this case and static properties, which are all well-defined as mathematical. So if you have some kind of program like here that does calculations, you can get math and you can just use the math, the, the properties and methods of the math class because that's what it knows to do. It doesn't care about the outside world much. You just feed it with the data and you get the results that you expect. Here's the bad class. So here's the class called magic. And it will have functions like print documents, send email, calculate distance between points. Don't do that. <clears throat> so keep your classes. They have what they need. They are encapsulated. They are black boxes. Don't expose what you don't have to. <clears throat> and keep them as self-contained as possible to, for their purpose. Coupling is the, the other side of it. I mean, it's pretty much the, the opposite of it. Coupling means how much two classes would be depending on each other's implementation. And keeping classes uh, um, highly coupled is, is also, unless you really have to do that in some way, in, in, for some good reason, it's good to keep the cohesion high and the coupling low. So <clears throat> in this case, for example, we have coupling, which is high. Although we've talked about the cohesion of the um, drive itself, um, the coupling between what you can plug to it, uh, I mean, I can take this whole unit and replace it with another. So 
the coupling here is quite loose because this cable may be representing a communication between the two classes and this cable can just talk to this class or another class and and you can easily replace it and 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 uh, and that's a, that's um, that's a good because this cable doesn't care about it and this uh, drive doesn't care about what's on the other end. <clears throat> on the other hand, when you have tight coupling like here, um, when things are inseparable and they depend on each other and you can't so easily disconnect the implementation on both sides. So, for example, sometimes classes do need to interact with each other. <clears throat> if we have a class of a report that has some data in it, and we have a class of a printer that will print this, we can have a method called print that will get a report as a, as a um, parameter. <clears throat> so they can know about each other, and they can interact with each other, but keep it as as mm, distant as possible. Well, for example, these two classes <coughs> are both um, relating to math, and they are using each other. So this class actually uses properties of this class and it's also um, setting some data in this class which is also a bad idea so once you have classes that start really interacting close, too closely with each other um, you have to think whether this is, this is the right thing And, yeah, this is a complete spaghetti where the printer can load a report and check a report. And this is actually, um, these are the things that the report has to take care of. And the report can load a printer driver, so the report can print. So in, in some cases, um, this is okay. For example, if the report no, should know how to print itself, let's say, but if the report here is referencing the printer class and starts using it in, in, in a bad way, then you'll get some spaghetti of the two classes completely interwined. So think about your classes again, the cohesion to keep them as self-contained as possible, and coupling, well, sometimes uh, strong coupling is, is important, but in many cases it's, uh, it's good to keep coupling as low as possible to keep them from knowing about each other as much as possible. So we've covered the, the basic fundamentals of every object-oriented programming uh, design and most object-oriented programming languages. The inheritance um, between classes, the encapsulation of data that keeps the data concealed in your class abstraction that can be achieved by creating abstract classes and then implementing them or with uh, interfaces and polymorphism that lets your code go to the right method when it needs to. Um, hide your data, think about your hierarchy of implementations and keep your cohesion and, and loose coupling to avoid mess pretty much. Questions? I didn't put this thing here. I have two questions. Okay. First is how inheritance is considered as coupling and then as no inheritance. Inheritance is is a is not really related to coupling, but again uh, you have to think about um, 
uh, inheritance is more about abstraction of your data. So if a dog has a tail and you need to access this property at the dog level, you, you could also put it at the higher level of creature, for example, but you have to separate your data between the, the hierarchy so that it matches the level that you're working with. So keep your, your data separate. And, and also, of course, that inheritance works only one way. So you can access properties of your base class, but your base class cannot, uh, usually cannot access uh, properties of its inherited classes unless they start knowing about each other in some recursive way. Um, so I inheritance is not really um, so much related to coupling because once you have inheritance, it's like a group of classes in itself which manages its hierarchy and where what is implemented where is depending there on, on the hierarchy again. So this is not really the same topic. Also about the reflection. Reflection. I don't see anything about reflection in our um, planet. Maybe it's not covered. And also the reflection and um, public and private and protected dependence. Public and private and protected what? Reflection, how it's interrupted. Reflection doesn't care. Reflection. With reflection you can you can implement you can call private methods, you can set private fields. Um, you can um, dynamically call methods by constructing their their names. Reflection is a powerful tool, but it's not a uh, common practice unless you really, really need it to, to use it. It is a tool which is given by the framework. There is a system reflection um, uh, namespace which which contains all the functionality. Um, but it, it is usually some kind of uh, hack, in a way. Unless you really need to do something which you cannot do in any other way. There, I have encountered a few cases like this. Uh, <clears throat> but in most cases, in most regular cases, you won't be using it, which I guess it, it could be a little bit outside the scope of, of, of this level, of course, but um, perhaps it's possible um, I could demonstrate some of it, maybe if we have a short, shorter session next time. You can access them, yes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, one example that we're using reflection is in our tests. Um, sometimes you want to uh, you want to run certain tests on certain class, and you want to see if it behaves the, the right way. Um, but you don't want to create a whole operation with your system, so you will sometimes use a method called mock that will create some kind of fake instance of your class. And sometimes you have an instance of the class, but you want to specifically go and inject some data into it and then see if it behaves the right way with this data. So this is one example for, for testing. It's sometimes being used. Um, but yeah, in other cases, it is hackish uh, to use reflection. It's it's not a common practice, uh, and it's definitely not some not the best practice. Unless you can't avoid it, you need to go around something. Um, 
or you need to it's used um, for example um, there is a big um, library called enterprise library which is <coughs> which is an external open open library that you can include in your code uh, which gives a lot of functionality it can give you interception of function calls so you can get triggered when a certain function is called or when some collection is being changed it gives a lot of control and uh, the way that it's do doing that is by doing a lot of reflection behind the scenes so if you need to it's plugging into your code in a way and taking over some of the functions that uh, and doing them through reflection so it gives you more control on what's going on and things that you usually don't don't access directly Not sure reflection is the right thing to do in such cases <coughs> because it doesn't build your code, it doesn't compile anything. It just gives you a more powerful way to, to explore your classes and to access things, to, to invoke certain methods. Um, that's also another example of if you have in certain cases, let's say certain remote cases, you need to invoke different methods in different cases and you need to send them with different parameters and you can do it through reflection also. It's a very powerful tool. It's not very performant in many ways because it has to go through a lot of um, a lot of behind the scenes code to do what usually the, the framework does very efficiently in order to give you this, this control, but uh, it's useful sometimes. It's useful for testing, but uh, in other scenarios where you can't avoid it. In Windows features, uh, that won't go through reflection, because... No, because those features would usually be outside the framework, and they, for those you need the Windows API directly, and that's that's a different kind of hack. But <coughs> reflection is part of the framework; it works only within the frameworks. And again, it's a tool; it's useful when when you need it or when you can't avoid it. Any more? Well, in many cases, you will have some kind of coupling between because the classes uh, do need to interact in, in many ways. Uh, like a printer can get a report object and know what to do with it. Uh, although in some cases it should work the other way around. The report should know how to print itself. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, it's some kind of combination. So the uh, printer gets a report object to print and then it calls some method on the report like get me the formatted get me the report as a string for example and I will already I'll, I'll know what to do with it things like that so sometimes classes do have to to know about each other but just don't let them you know go like this into each other and, and run codes which is not relevant to them that's that's the idea keep your keep them as separate as possible
Yes, you're creating dependency. You're creating spaghetti code that is jumping from one class to another, and it's, uh, unless it's with a good reason. Um, one more thing, why main should be some class? Okay, we have some classes in our assembly, in our mm -hmm. program. Why we should get the main in some class when it's not the class itself? We it's a static class. First of all, you can add other things to this class, but um, everything in C Sharp is classes. You cannot have any code block which is not in a class, so or a struct or an interface. So it's it's just the way that it's architectured. It has to be in a class. No, it has to have an implement, uh, a real concrete implementation of this class. Uh, yeah. All right, more? Okay.